Hey guys, so today we're going to be looking at the bones and joints of the shoulder complex. So first, let's take a look at the bones of the shoulder complex itself. Now I drew these pictures real quick in GIMP for identification of these landmarks and just making it a little bit easy to identify them. So let's first just take a brief look here at what we call the scapula. Now let's orient ourselves while looking at the scapula. This scapula right here is the anterior view of the scapula and this would be the posterior view of the scapula so let's keep in mind also that this would be a right scapula so if we're looking at someone uh, from the, the back this would be where their arm would be and this would be the right side of their body so go ahead and first note that the scapula kind of looks like this triangle right and just like a triangle we have borders and we have angles to it as well so it's going to be no different here for the scapula itself so let's take a look at the borders now the first borders we're gonna look at are right here this big long border we call this the medial or the vertebral border medial because it's towards the midline of the body and vertebral because this is right next to the vertebral column or your spine the other border we'll look at is right here. So keep in mind that we wouldn't um, be ex we wouldn't take the time to add an extra word in defining a landmark of a bone or a part of the body if it didn't have some sort of counterpart. If it only had one border, I would say this is just the border of the scapula, but I called it the medial border. So that means that it has another border to it. So the counter opposite. Um, word for medial is lateral. So right here would be the lateral border. Again, with the idea that this looks like a triangle, we said that we had angles. So we have some angles right here. We have some angles low, or what we call inferior, because inferior means below. These are the inferior angles of the scapula. Up here at the top of the scapula, we have the superior angles being the counterpart. So the next landmark we're going to start looking at is this little uh, appendage right here. Kind of looks like a finger, or as the translation from Greek uh, means, uh, raven's beak. This is what we call the coracoid process. Right here would be another process called the acromion process. And then the acromion process can be also seen right here um, from the posterior view as well. <clears throat> the acromion process hooks around towards the front of the scapula. Now, you can kind of see it right here, but you can definitely see it uh, from the posterior margin right here that the acromion process comes off of, projects off of this landmark, which is called the spine of the scapula, which is a very easily palpable landmark on yourself and your clients and kind of helps you understand and find and define the borders and uh, shape of the scapula itself. So with that said, the spine of the scapula then separates this posterior view of the shoulder blade into what we call two fossas. Now what exactly is a fossa? A fossa is a term defining a bony landmark which means it's a shallow depression. This is a depression in the bone itself. So right here we have two fossas, one above the spine of the scapula and then one situated below the spine of the scapula right here. So using our anatomical terms, if we said something was above something, it was to said to be su superior. And then if it was said to be below, it was inferior. So using these terms and then understanding that fossa means shallow depression, we have a shallow depression here below, an inferior fossa, and then a superior fossa. But inferior and superior to what? Well, it would be the spine of the scapula. So up here we have the supra, which is derivative of superior, supra spinous fossa, which means the fossa, the shallow depression, above the spine of the scapula. And then here we have the infraspinous fossa, again, which means the shallow depression below the spine of the scapula. So we do have another fossa that we're going to look at, a big fossa, which is right here on the anterior 
part of the shoulder blade itself. So this would be on the front of the shoulder blade. And this would be technically underneath the shoulder blade. It's hidden underneath the shoulder blade because we can't really access it too easily. We call this sub. Sub means uh, below or underneath. Subscapular fossa. This is a depression underneath the scapula. So this is the subscapula fossa. And then the last landmark we're going to look at is this landmark right here, this little fossa as well. You can also see it technically on this uh, posterior side, but my drawing's not too well to depict this projection of the bone. We call this the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. Now, we're not going to cover every single landmark in all, on all of these bones. There are a few that we're going to leave out, such as the supra and infra glenoid tubercle, but hopefully you'll be able to use your understanding of anatomy language to understand if someone said the infra glenoid tubercle, well, this is just a little bump on the bottom of the glenoid fossa. So let's move on to the humerus here. Now with the humerus, the first thing we're going to look at is this big bulbous projection at the top. So just as we have a big bulbous projection at the top of our bodies called a head, so does this bone. This would be the head of the humerus, which actually articulates with that glenoid fossa to make our shoulder joint. The next landmark <clears throat> that we're going to look at is this big bump right here off to the side of the um, head of the humerus here called the greater tubercle. It's the greater tubercle. Tuber, tubercle meaning a projection off of a bone. So because we called it the greater tubercle, remember that means it has to have another component. And in this case, the lesser tubercle, which can be seen right here. Uh, on the anterior part, this would be the anterior margin of the humerus. This is the posterior. So on the front of the humerus would be the greater, or excuse me, lesser tubercle right here. <clears throat> The next landmark we're going to look at is this little bump right here on both sides. Another little what we call tuberosity, just a projection bump on a bone. We call this the deltoid tuberosity. So if you could guess it, this has something to do with the deltoids, and it's actually the common insertion point of the deltoid muscle group. Now again, like we said, we're not going to mention every landmark here. We do have some ridges coming off of each tubercle, and then we have a groove or um, uh, shallow uh, little canal between the two called the intertubicular groove. So hopefully again you can use your anatomical um, language to understand what these landmarks might be. Now keep in mind that we're going to cover the lower half of the humerus in another lecture for the forearm and the hand, so stay tuned for that. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we call the clavicle here. This is our clavicle, or in layman's, excuse me, layman's terms, the collarbone. So with the clavicle, we're going to look at two parts here. Now there's plenty of other landmarks in between that we're just not going to really pay much attention to. We're just going to look at the two ends of this bone. So one end over here is what we call the acromial end, which reaches out and touches that acromion process of the scapula. The other end is what we call the sternal end, which reaches out and touches the sternum. So with that said, let's go ahead and look at the sternum. Now to start with, let's look at the landmarks that line up with the sternal end of that clavicle. So we have these two little notches right here, two little nicks in this part of the bone called the clavicular notches of the sternum. So this is where the clavicle would meet the sternum. Again, we do have another notch right here, which <clears throat> I'm sure most people have heard this word before. So we've all referred to the throat as the jugular, and there's probably some people out there you wish you could punch there. Please don't punch anyone in their throat. That's mean. But this little notch right here sits at the base of the throat and is what we call the jugular notch. So let's take a brief look at the shape of the sternum and notice that it kind of looks like a necktie. So there's two parts, two um, accumulated parts to the sternum here. We have this big upper knot, if we were considering it to be the um, idea of the 
necktie, and then a lower part right here called the body. So the necktie part up here is what we call the manubrium, while this lower part is called the body. Now, looking at the um, part where they meet, the two parts of the sternum meet, the manubrium and the body, we see that there's this kind of little, little ridge here, this little angle. And if you actually looked at someone from the side, you would see that the sternum kind of hooks and kind of has a little bend to it. And so this is the angle of the sternum. So the next landmarks we're going to look at are these little notches right here. Now, there would be seven on a sternum. I kind of rushed this drawing and didn't put as much time uh, as I did on the other ones. But you can see that there's little grooves right here. And they would be where the ribs were to meet, or at least the costal, or excuse me, the cartilage of those ribs, because <clears throat> the cartilage is what extends from the bone and actually touches the sternum. So the word that we use to um, reference ribs is cos or costal. So this would be the costal, what we call facet, uh, or the facet joint, or um, yeah, they call it a bunch of different things. But think like a facet like on your ring where you put the gemstone in and then it holds the gemstone in place. So facet, facet, or facet joint itself here, the little facet as well. So this would be where the ribs were to meet, the sternum at the costal facet, facet, or whatever joint. Anyways. So the last landmark we're going to look at for the sternum here is this lower margin, this lower little appendage right here. And now if you've taken a CPR class, you've probably heard this before, heard about this bone, this part of the bone. It's called the xiphoid process. And they tell you about this in CPR class because you can actually break this bone. So be careful with uh, CPR there. So That'll sum up the bony landmarks. Let's go ahead and take a look at the joints as we put these different parts and landmarks of the bones together. All right, so we're going to look at the joints now. So we looked at those bony landmarks, and we're going to put those bony landmarks together and make what we call an articulation or a joint. Articulation is just where two bones come together, two or more bones come together at that. So let's go ahead and knock out the really easy joints. So we looked at the clavicle and we looked at the two parts of the clavicle being the uh, acromial end and the clavicular, or excuse me, sternal end. So one end of the clavicle touches the acromion process and then the other end touches the sternum here. So the first little uh, notch we're going to, or um, joint we're going to look at is the acromioclavicular notch. This is the uh, articulation between the acromion process and the acromial end of the clavicle. Now there are some movements that do occur here, but we're not going to look at them um, in the sakes of massage therapy. <clears throat> we do have some elevation and things like that and some movements there and, and minute things. Uh, we also even don't look at uh, ligaments and other um, things such as that. Now we do have a joint capsule. We should understand that all synovial joints have joint capsules. And of course they're going to have ligaments as well, but usually the ligaments are named after the bones that they connect and where exactly on those bones they connect. So we'd have the uh, acromioclavicular ligament and, and other ligaments such as that. So we're not going to look at all the ligaments and everything again, just like we didn't look at all of the bony landmarks as well. So on the opposite end of the clavicle here, we have where it meets the sternum, we have the sternoclavicular joint, which is the joint between the sternal end of the clavicle and the clavicular notch of the sternum. Real simple, real easy. So let's go ahead and get into some joints that aren't as simple or easy. So namely where the head of the humerus meets the glenoid cavity of that shoulder blade of that scapula. And so this forms the glenohumeral joint. So this is a ball and socket type joint because we know that the glenoid cavity is a shallow depression and then the head of the humerus is like a little ball and then it moves and articulates like a ball and a socket in that joint there. <clears throat> 
So like we said, this is one of the most freely movable joints in the body. And with the help of the movement of the shoulder blade itself, and we'll see how that moves in just a little bit, it gets extra range of motion as well. So what movements do occur here at the glenohumeral joint? Well, clearly we have flexion. So if we're looking at them from the side, we can flex it forward and then we can extend it backwards. So we have flexion and extension for this joint. We also then have abduction and adduction. So if we take the arm out to the side, we have abduction. If we bring the arm from the side back down, we have adduction. Be very careful of that one letter difference, meaning something completely different. Now, with the add and abduction, we also have the possibilities of doing different types of add and abduction. So if our arm is out to the side and parallel to the body and we were to bring it straight across for a hug, we would call that horizontal abduction and adduction. So this would be the adduction, horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction. <clears throat> now, if we had it up here high at an angle and brought it down like we're doing a really cool hug. Hi, what's up, buddy? Then we would have what we call transverse adduction and transverse abduction coming in at that oblique plane. So at this joint here, we can see that the shoulder can turn in and it can turn out. So we have internal rotation or what we would call medial rotation as well. And then we have external rotation or lateral rotation as well. So then all of those movements we've just mentioned combined can come together to make this nice circular movement. And Mr. Uh, Dexter here isn't too uh, fluid with his movements, but it would make this nice circular motion called circumduction, which is a combination of flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and rotation all in one little package there. So keep in mind, if we were to just leave our shoulder blade fixed in place, we would only get about 90 degrees, maybe less depending on your anatomy of abduction before you really kind of hit that part of the shoulder, uh, the acromion process of the shoulder blade. So the, the reason we can actually get our arm higher is because of the movement allowed by the shoulder blade. So right here we have a joint called the scapulothoracic joint. Scapulo, scapular, scapula, thoracic for rib cage or the thorax. So the scapulothoracic joint is technically not a traditional joint because it's not supported by the common things that support joints, such as having a, a joint capsule and having ligamentous structures. So the scapulothoracic joint is all held in place by muscles. So this is completely based off of muscles and it requires the integrity of muscles. So this is why you really want to really keep the integrity of your shoulder blades or your shoulder muscles really well for the sake and safety of you yourself and your career as we mentioned when it came to biomechanics and uh, longevity to your career. So what can the scapulothoracic joint do, this false joint? Well, we can do protraction. If we were to take the scapula and slide it forward as if we were to come into that hug, hug ourselves, our shoulder blades are coming forward. <clears throat> and we call that protraction. Now, if we brought that shoulder blade back, we have retraction. That is retraction of the scapula. Now, if we look at the um, scapula here, we notice that it formed that little triangle with that little point. So that point can turn and rotate. So we have rotation that's possible at the scapula here as well. And it can rotate either upward or it can rotate downward. Based off of the orientation, let's basically take the acromion process here as our orientation. So if the acromion process points up, that's upward rotation. And then if it points down, that would be downward rotation. So the shoulder blade too can also lift up. If we shrug our shoulders like, oh, I don't know, this lecture is kind of crazy. It's really not. But that would be what we call elevation. Our shoulder would lift up 
So we would call that scapular elevation. Then of course it can also depress. It can be pulled down. So we're like, I don't know, I'm getting a little nervous. But then you realize it's simple and you let your shoulders drop and they depress down. So another possibility for your shoulder blade is what we call tilting, which means that if this were my shoulder blade, I could lift the edges up away from the thorax called tilting, kind of like how we have in pinball, we can tilt the machine to maybe try to um, move the ball a little bit and then we get uh, you know, kicked out and the game shuts us off there if you've ever played some pinball. So guys, that's going to do it for the joints there. Uh, stay tuned as we go ahead and do the muscles in another video. Have a great day.